collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambos. Coming up this week, the Deputy Minister to the President of Cyprus on the urgent need for reforms in the civil service. Unfortunately, in this country we had the misfortune, I would say, not to do anything for 50 or 60 years or anything uh, important. So many changes have to take place now. The Minister of Energy, Commerce, Industry and Tourism says things are improving for businesses in Cyprus. We have set a target uh, for the registrar of companies that they should, uh, we should be establishing a company within 24 hours if it's an online application and f- or 48 hours if it's a manual application. We'll talk to an Irish expert about creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem on the island. Well, the key uh, item that we have constantly placed on the agenda is the need for a focus on entrepreneurship and supports for small and medium-sized enterprises. And you can broaden your horizons with a MOOC. A massive open online course, and that means that you get onto your computer and you take it that way. Konstantinos Petridis is Deputy Minister to the President of Cyprus, tasked, among other things, with overseeing the reform of the civil service. It's a massive task, Konstantinos. How are you going to implement the changes that are needed? Listen, there are wide-ranging uh, changes in every different uh, ministry. There are horizontal changes that have to do with the mobility, that have to do with the payroll, that have to do with the promotion system, that have to do uh, with the appraisal system. So, I mean, generally speaking, all of these All of these changes have to do with the productivity of the civil service. If you have an efficient promotion system that will reward to the positions of the responsibility uh, the best, then you do increase the effectiveness and the productivity. Instead of having somebody who could, like now, uh, under this regime, uh, somebody could not be the best, but he was hired first. Or he had friends in the political spectrum. So we are trying to change this system. Regarding the mobility, you are having a more flexible civil uh, service that uh, the personnel is directed according to the needs. Okay, because uh, under this uh, current system, somebody was hired at the department and he, he, he was going to stay there for the rest of his life. You are having the PFM re- reform, the public financial management, that the, the measurement of the budget, the budget will be determined according to the measurement of the activities of each ministry and not according to the lines in the budget saying how many people you have so you need that much money. What are your activities? How much people do you need to carry out these activities? Have you produced results in carrying out those activities? Do those activities coincide with the general economic policy of the government? So, The reformers are wide-ranging. But that begs the question, how are you going to even start to implement them? Are you looking at it holistically and trying to do it all at once, or do you have to take it one step at a time? For me, reform, I mean, things do happen in parallel. Unfortunately, in this country, we had the misfortune, I would say, not to do anything for 50 or 60 years or anything uh, important. So many changes have to take place now. Some are more successful than others, but actually the whole system is changed. A lot of this effort is done in parallel. Nevertheless, uh, the reform is a continuous process. And after we finish this job, I mean, the reform has to continue. It's a dynamic process. Every now and then, the system has to be fine-tuned in order not to reach another, another moment in time, in 20 years, in 10 years, that we will face the collapse again and we have to do drastic changes uh, at once. We are trying. It is difficult. It's a multidimensional process. Uh, In every change there is a reaction. But we are changing. I'm going to pass, uh, I believe, the legislative proposals regarding the the promotion system, the payroll, the appraisal system before the summer. 
Uh, You've got to get it through Parliament, of course. And yes, I hope that it will be voted by the end of the year by the Parliament. But have you spoken to the political parties? Many because times. they have been using the public service yes. system for years to promote their friends, uh, jobs yes, for the, the boys. The, all the political parties have been saying that um, uh, we do support the civil reform, uh, a civil service reform. So I have consulted with them. I believe that we do propose uh, drastic changes. And uh, if they meant what they said, that they, uh, their priority is the civil service reform, they will vote for it. And, and I think they will. I think they will. Once you get it through, you've got to actually sort of implement it in all the different ministries, and you've got to implement it, I imagine, initially, with civil servants who are of the old regime, as you put it. So how is that going to work? It's an, um, change management. It, it's an issue that I'm trying to address through education, through workshops, through... Uh, through talking to the civil service. I mean, at first you have to pass the, the political decisions, and then you are fo we have to focus. I mean, there is going to be a transitional period for every kind of change. I mean, you cannot implement, for example, an exam system for promotions from one day to another. You need a few months. You, you have to train the people. You have to give them the opportunity to digest it. Uh, it is something that um, we are working on, but we are going to, to focus more on that after the summer and after we are sure and certain that uh, our proposals will, uh, will, will pass through the Parliament. Now, one of the things you were talking about at the conference on entrepreneurship and the ecosystem of entrepreneurs and SMEs was the role of the public service, the ministries and so on, in helping, in a sense, the private sector, startups and so on and so forth. How do you get that message across? Because the bureaucracy, as we all know, is yeah, uh, very time-consuming. You know, You're talking in terms of months. One of the other speakers was talking about the years that it took for some people to get the results uh, they needed. How but do you, you have to go into? down to the basics. What is the role of the public sector? Why the public sector it, it even exists, going back in time? It's to help the people. It's to help the people to conduct their businesses, is to help the people to, to provide a social net, uh, a safety network. Nevertheless, under this excuse, this justification of helping the society or of protecting the society, we have developed over-regulation over the years with a justification for every rule and every provision in the law that um, we have to protect the people by having more and more and more regulations, by having more and more and more authorities, by having more and more and more vetoes, okay, in the name of protection of the protection of the society. Well, now it's the time to go the other way around. It's time to deregulate, okay? It's something that they did it in the UK, they did it in, in, in Ireland. It is um, a priority of the European Commission, uh, according also to the Juncker governance of the European Commission, simpler regulation, streamlining regulation, because for years we have been building distortions and rules and rules and regulations, and now we have realized that instead of helping the society, this has overburdened the society and the business community especially. So now we have to go the other way around. It's difficult. There will be reaction. It does take time. I have experts conducting studies that they take months because it's not, it's not easy. I mean, you have to change the whole institutional and uh, legislative system. You have to be sure that you are not taking away any powers from everybody that will, will create any problems. So it's a lengthy process, but I think we will we'll start having results in the next year. In a nutshell, what's the end result that you are aiming at? A more productive and efficient country. And for to have a more productive country where the private sector can thrive and can produce and can, can provide uh, prosperity for everybody, we have to make sure that we have a civil service that uh, will satisfy okay, the demands of the society and the private sector, the ones who pay them. Konstantinos Petridis, Deputy Minister to the President of Cyprus. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. 
There was a conference in Nicosia yesterday on reinforcing the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Cyprus. It was attended by the Minister of Energy, Commerce, Industry and Tourism, George Lakotripis, and I asked him how important the conference was for his ministry's work to improve the economy of the island. Let me just uh, say that um, what we consider this is a first step towards um, a general public consultation with all stakeholders about uh, creating this ecosystem. Uh, this ecosystem which should be based on, on, on four uh, pillars. These four pillars are the uh, outward looking of our businesses in Cyprus, creating a culture of entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, improvement of business environment to make it uh, predictable for investors, and of course, a uh, very crucial uh, fourth pillar which has been uh, problematic for our businesses over the past few years is access to finance. Uh, we look forward to the results uh, of these uh, workshops that are taking place today. This is the first time that we're having such a, a wide uh, consultation. Uh, we expect to hear from businesses, from education, from government bodies what they feel we should do in order uh, to have tangible results with, as you heard in the opening, uh, with specific key performance indicators as well. Poray Hennessy, who was over here from Ireland, was saying that, and they've turned it around with quite incredible speed actually in Ireland, he was saying that all the government departments were given the same priorities. And that's one of the things that it seems to me sometimes doesn't work in Cyprus, is that the ministries don't work <coughs> together <coughs> on goals. I, I totally agree with you, but, and as you have seen, this uh, event today was co-organized not only by my ministry, but by the presidency as well. Uh, the presidency's role in this respect is very crucial in coordinating and synchronizing all of the ministries. All of the ministries are working towards similar goals, but with different directions. So the presidency should overlook to make sure that all of the action items that will be agreed will be followed upon by the various ministries, various bodies, and uh, uh, the whole effort from here on takes more, a more strategic nature uh, rather than being the role of just one ministry with uh, a disconnect, just like you very correctly said, from other ministries and potential. Um, and, and for the potential implementation. And education was something that was very much emphasised here. It is important, isn't it, to get the young people thinking in terms of possibly the private sector and being innovative and entrepreneurial rather than just hunting for that safe job in the civil service for the rest of their life. Uh, uh, absolutely, and um, uh, one of the four pillars, of course, is the culture of entrepreneurship, uh, and we are already backing that culture up uh, with um, a multi-million dollar grants, for, uh, euro grants, from uh, the Ministry of Structural Funds, whether it's for youth entrepreneurship or women's entrepreneurship or even uh, innovation entrepreneurship that we have launched, and we will continue to support that. We, we all have seen that uh, the positions in the public sector have, are frozen. They, it's forecasted that they will remain to be frozen with some various exceptions for some years to come. Uh, so the only way that we will, will create jobs is indeed through uh, the private sector and uh, it is indeed through promoting the youth, our youth, to be in entrepreneurship, to be innovative. And the ministry itself, you mentioned there is funding, and of course there were representatives here from the European Union uh, talking about growth and so on. How closely can you work with them? We are getting better, I think, in Cyprus at accessing the European funding that is available. We already have a, a, a big junk, almost 900 uh, million of funding, a bit more than that, from structural funds. The key bet here is uh, to have maximum absorption of these funds, something which we have been struggling with over the past few years, because um, one of the main reasons is because of the lack of financing as well. To, uh, for example, to somebody who was getting a grant of 50,000 euros, they had trouble getting the other 50,000 which was required. Uh, we, that's for the reason why we're working closely with the commercial banks in order to help access to financing for those who are successful in their bids. On the other hand, there are various uh, competitive projects from the EU whom um, uh, now, over the past few years, we have really started to compete and compete with some uh, solid 
chances of success. Already we have, I can mention, two in the energy sector for um, uh, thermal, uh, heliothermic uh, units. Uh, we received, uh, I believe, for each project about 50 or 60 million grants from the European Union, and those were competitive. Uh, we would certainly urge every businessman, whether it's a startup, whether it's an established enterprise, to look at the competitive uh, bits in Europe for granting because uh, we have a good story to uh, present. We have a lot of know-how that we can leverage. The only problem very often is the bureaucracy involved in setting up a company mm. here. That hasn't changed greatly, I think. What can you do about that? Uh, to be honest with you, it has. If you look at over the past, uh, I would dare say, six, eight weeks, we have set a target uh, for the registrar of companies that they should, uh, we should be establishing a company within 24 hours if it's an online application and f or 48 hours if it's a manual application. Uh, the last information I had from the professional bodies of the lawyers and the accountants is that we are down to three days uh, and we will continue to push to improve that even further. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, but then the primary challenge that we have now is to make that sustainable. This is where, why in parallel we're also working on improving the processes and procedures, cutting red tape, but technology as well. I was going to just ask yes. you finally, I know you have to go, e-governance is something that can so greatly improve productivity in the civil service, the service that's given to the private sector and cut the red tape and the bureaucracy. You've got a history, I think, former history with Microsoft and technology, so this is your field. Is the ministry in any position to push forward the e-governance plans that I know the government has, but they seem to be taking forever? Um, as far as the Ministry is concerned, we are really looking towards technology in order to improve productivity, but also people's lives. So we are looking at potential services that will be government to business or government to uh, citizen. As an example, I will mention for government to citizen is the uh, access we will give to people uh, for live data for the prices of fuel uh, around the country. Uh, that is a significant step. At, as small as it might sound, it's a significant step, step for giving uh, consumers and citizens power in their hands to make their choices. Similarly, for generally the e-governance, the presidency has taken it at a strategic level. Uh, we truly feel that it would uh, make a difference, both, again, from a government-to-business perspective, but also from a government-to-citizen perspective, and also government-to-government. -government. There is so much need for interconnecting systems and making uh, people's lives and businesses' lives much, much simpler. We and much quicker. And much quicker. Uh, speed and agility is uh, the two fundamental words that we're seeking here. So we are pushing at that. We know that it's not as quickly as we, even us, we would have liked to, and certainly the constituents, but uh, we will continue to prioritize what needs to go out based on the priorities of the country as well. We need to start uh, from somewhere, we have started from the priorities and we will continue to go down the list. George Lacotribis, Minister of Commerce, Energy, Tourism and... Industry. Industry. <laughs> Pretty well everything. Thank you very much indeed for Thank joining. you very much. Thanks a lot. You can subscribe to the Cypress News Digest on iTunes for free and get the program downloaded to your phone or tablet so you can listen anytime, anywhere. Poreg Hennessy gave the keynote speech at that conference on reinforcing the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Cyprus. He's the SME envoy of Ireland, and he was talking about the Irish experience. He joins us on the Cyprus News Digest. Ireland, of course, has been through very similar problems that we are going through at the moment in Cyprus, but you seem to be very proactive right from the start to actually try and turn things round. How did you do it? Well, the current government on taking office in 2011 uh, put a very strong focus on the whole question of jobs. Jobs was to be the central theme for every government minister and jobs were to be delivered. Targets were set, 100,000 jobs by 2016. 100,000 net jobs, I should say, since before 2016. That has been surpassed already. And it was achieved with a very keen focus by the Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, and his, his senior economic ministers uh, with regular cabinet meetings, monthly cabinet meetings, focused on jobs. 
And that was across all government departments. Now, I know that you've had meetings with our own Minister of Commerce and with other European countries. If we put this into a European context... I mean, Juncker has just approved, I think, a huge budget to try and encourage SMEs across the European bloc. So at the meetings that you've had with other countries like Portugal, well, other countries like Cyprus, what have you been telling them? Well, the key uh, item that we have constantly placed on the agenda is the need for a focus on entrepreneurship and supports for small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, a very keen focus on that will need to be kept at European and national level if we are to achieve growth in sustainable jobs and that has been a focus of the Irish government uh, for the last number of years. And young people are really at the forefront of much of this because they can very often be the innovators and it's innovation that's needed for successful entrepreneurship, isn't it? Indeed, uh, innovation is a critical element of the whole package but it's not the sole element of the package. There is a need to educate uh, uh, younger people in the capabilities that they already possess indeed in what they can contribute. There is a need to educate them in financial issues and make sure that they don't get themselves into difficulties and do find the appropriate support. There is a need to educate them in terms of international markets and what's out there as well as local and regional markets and there is a need to ensure that they receive the types of supports that are necessary for small businesses to start up grow and develop. And you've achieved so much in Ireland, but you can't just sit back and say we've met our targets, can you? How do you keep the train rolling, as it were? Well, the focus is being kept on uh, by a constant uh, repetition of the jobs mantra. Jobs are key, keeping people employed is key, and growing the jobs agenda. We have uh, had a major decrease in our unemployment level but it's not an acceptable level at close to 10% still. We're working on ensuring that the focus is kept on at a regional level and a local level and we are developing what are known as action plans for jobs in the eight regions of Ireland which will be published within the next couple of months. Is there a finite limit to the number of jobs you can create? Well, the, uh, all economies have a finite limit, uh, but our, ours certainly is nowhere near uh, a figure of 10% unemployed. We would much, uh, much prefer to be in a situation where we would be down at uh, what was generally accepted in the past to be 5 or 6% full employment. And does it make, a, it must make a huge difference, the fact that as part of the European Union there is the mobility, there is the opportunity, not necessarily to create your SME in your own country. Is that something you encourage or does Ireland not benefit from that if your young entrepreneurs go and set up in Cyprus or Malta? Well, our focus is very much on generating jobs in, in Ireland uh, at the moment, but uh, if, if people wish to go and can succeed with language and cultural issues in different countries, uh, if they've been educated well enough to do that, well then it's a great achievement for our educational system as well. And they may well come back eventually to Ireland well, with successful businesses. Well that would be our hope and indeed we're, we're uh, planning uh, later this year to have a start-up gathering uh, back in Ireland which uh, will be linked into the Web Summit which is held in October in Dublin uh, that people will come back to Ireland and see how the vista has changed in the last number of years and the supports that are available for them to start up. Paul Reg Hennessy, thank you very much indeed for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Harlandis. The biggest achievement of Crime Stoppers has been the ability of the public to be able to give information about crime anonymously. There's no way I could have kept prostituting without the drugs. There's no way I could have had my body used like a public toilet because that's actually what prostitution is. And then the fourth series I started three days after I'd won the Oscar. So the whole of the Monarch of the Glen experience was all interplatted with the Gosford Park Oscar experience. I was working with Ronnie James Dio and David was going to 
reform White Snake in 2003. Cyprus was chosen because Cyprus is a stable, peaceful and uh, secure place. We have to really look closely what are we doing with children, what are we doing with adolescents and what are we doing with adults that can help them move into a more literate uh, situation. The ones that I'm proudest of are the ones that were true discoveries, where we found something we didn't know existed. Now, if you feel like continuing your studies, there are many ways these days, of course, of doing it. One of them is a MOOC. What's a MOOC? Joining me from the University of Sheffield is Professor Jim Fitzmaurice. Jim, explain a MOOC, because I think you've got one that's I starting do. on the 29th of June. 29th of June, yes. It's a, a massive open online course, and that means that you get onto your computer and you take it that way. And the uh, open part means that it's free. You don't have to pay a penny, so you just get onto your computer. It's a future learn MOOC, and FutureLearn is the platform. FutureLearn is the, the company, which is a, an affiliate with Open University in the UK. And so you go to FutureLearn, you go to University of Sheffield, MOOC, and Literature of the English Country House. And what are you going to cover in the literature of the English country house? I suppose a couple of centuries ago, that's where an awful lot of literature was actually written. I'm thinking of Jane Austen and things like that. That is right. I don't know if she was, I guess she was in a country house. She certainly wrote about, Jane Austen wrote about country houses. So we're going to have a week that is Jane Austen week. And we will have Mr. Darcy and we will have Chatsworth House. And we've actually been out to Chatsworth House and filmed there twice, spent two days uh, shooting and having uh, regular teaching staff from the University of Sheffield School of English talk to us. People who are Jane Austen people talk to us about Chatsworth House and Jane Austen's literature. And what other authors spring to mind that you'll be covering? Well, there's Charles Dickens, Great Expectations, and you may remember Miss Havisham, who was in a country house wearing her what was it anyway, her bridal dress mm -hmm. from years and years back and her wedding cake, the, the jilted Miss Havisham. So there's Charles Dickens. Uh, there's Shakespeare with, what is it, uh, Twelfth Night. And Twelfth Night set in, you know, set in Illyria, but Illyria is really an English country house. So if people take this MOOC, it's how many weeks? It is six weeks. And do they go online once a week, or how does it work? They go online, and they read the reading, and on each step there's an opportunity to discuss. And so if you want to, you put up a, uh, a discussion post of some sort saying, well, I read Pride and Prejudice, or didn't read all of it, but I read a piece of Pride and Prejudice, and I listened to the the information that came from the from the teaching staff and here's my question i don't understand this i don't understand that and then other people who are also on the course respond or the teaching staff respond or the mentors respond and at the end of the course do they get something well at the end of the course if they want to they can buy a certificate which says i was on the course or they just get out of the course what they learned they also make friends, I think. This is the second time we've run the class. And the first time we started with 11,000 and uh, quite a few people, but it was free all around the world. Uh, about, oh, 35% maybe was UK and 25% was Americans and then the rest from everywhere, North, South America, Canada, all around the world, China, Australia. and. Um, I think we finished with maybe three or 4,000 who simply did everything or almost everything and took all the quizzes and the final exam. And um, So it's really just a way of you broadening your knowledge on a topic that possibly you don't know as much about or you'd exactly. like to discuss the, more, the finer details. That, that is it. And it's, we are trying to make it into a university course. And so it's kept, uh, the level is kept fairly high. And there were people who fell by the wayside because they didn't have the time. Or, you know, it, was, it maybe it was a little too tough for some folks, but it was certainly a university course. And if you want to go look at a university course, you can take it. And then if you don't like it the first time, you can take it, you know, maybe in October because it'll come up again. Uh, so you take it, take it again if you like it or take a different 
Mooks. So look for Mooks. M O O C. That's it. Massive open online course. That is. And you'll find them also at the University of Sheffield. Jim Fitzmaurice, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.